The Sign Institute of Policy and Politics is American University's incubator for policy innovation. We convene leaders in the academic, public, private, nonprofit, and journalism sectors to engage and promote common ground and nonpartisan solutions. In an evolving world, we seize the opportunity to work on the nation's most pressing challenges through collaboration by experts and top scholars in their field with students in research and scholarship. As part of that goal, the Sign Institute leverages American University's location in our nation's capital, the nexus of government and a growing international business center. We connect diverse perspectives from around the country and around the world with our world-class academics and research experienced practitioners and the most politically active student body in the U.S. We stand apart through our focus on the role of business and the nonprofit community in public policy, the rise of the importance of economic regions in the United States, and international policy issues. Our focus is to make an immediate impact at the intersection of policy and politics that leads to real and lasting change. Thank you for joining us as we convene, communicate, and collaborate. Introducing Sign Institute Fellow 2022, Barbara Comstock. Good afternoon. Wonderful to be with you uh, for today's program, which is going to be on women in the arena in the Supreme Court. And we're uh, very fortunate uh, to have a great special guest with us today, uh, Ruth Marcus, that I'll be introducing, but also that we are doing this at a time where we have an historic uh, nomination of Judge Katanji Brown Jackson. And uh, while there's been a lot of things going on in the world, I think that probably hasn't gotten enough attention because of uh, sort of the crisis times we're living in, but it is truly an exciting and historic nomination of the first uh, black woman to be on the Supreme Court. There have been 115 members of the Supreme Court to date. Only five of them have been women. Uh, now, we've discussed in previous classes how, you know, women first came to Congress in 1917. Of course, it wasn't really until the 70s that they started getting elected on a more regular basis, and there's still only about 30% uh, of Congress, but the Supreme Court took a quite a bit longer. In 1981, when I first came, I graduated from college, came to Washington to go to Georgetown Law School, um, was the year where Ronald Reagan had um, nominated Justice Sandra Day, Day O'Connor, the first woman to be nominated to the Supreme Court. Now, Ronald Reagan had uh, promised in his 1980 election to nominate a woman to the Supreme Court. So you all may have seen a little bit of the news recently that uh, some people were talking about that it was controversial that uh, Joe Biden, President Biden was nominating, said he was going to nominate a woman when he ran, but uh, Ronald Reagan did very much the same thing. And it came about because Ronald Reagan, in large part, and this is his, his own um, staff have kind of added this to the historical record along the way, have said that Ronald Reagan was dealing with a gender gap in 1980 when he ran against Jimmy Carter. And Margaret Heckler, who was then a Congresswoman from Massachusetts, a Republican, um, said, you know, it, this would be a good idea because Ronald Reagan at that time did not, you know, he, had, he didn't support abortion rights, didn't support the ERA. It was thought that that was hurting him with women, although we can discuss that separately. I don't think that necessarily was the issue, but he did um, just make this um, promise to nominate. He, he actually said one of his first picks, but indeed it was his first uh, choice to put on the Supreme Court. Now, one of the things that I also think is particularly interesting about Sandra Day O'Connor is that she did not have the traditional um, path to the Supreme Court because back then women did not get those traditional options. Now, Sandra Day O'Connor had gone to Stanford Law School. She had been number three in her class. Uh, number one in the class was um, Chief Justice Rehnquist. Um, and when she came onto the court, he, he was already on the Supreme Court when she came on, he wasn't Chief Justice yet. Um, they actually dated a little bit in college, just a little interesting aside, I, I, law school. He actually asked her to marry him. She went another way, uh, may not have ended up on the court if they had been married. But she ended up, when she got out of law school, while well, Justice Rehnquist 
had all these great offers as the number three uh, ranked student at Stanford. She was um, only offered like secretarial jobs. And she ended up uh, taking a job, I believe it was um, for no pay initially. She said she um, she worked in a, um, oh, I'm going to find my notes here. She, she was a magna cum laude graduate at number three. Um, she actually was married and she had difficulty finding her job. She was um, offered secretary jobs and took a job as a deputy county attorney in California after she offered to work for no salary and shared her office with a secretary. Eventually, you know, pretty quickly, they did decide to pay her because she was very good. Then her husband was drafted. She went off to Germany with her husband, worked as a civilian attorney um, in overseas, had three sons. And um, then when she came back to Arizona, which they were then living, she was an assistant attorney general in Arizona. She was appointed by the government to these Arizona Senate when there was an opening, but then she also got elected in her own right and became majority leader. And then she was appointed to the Maricopa County Superior Court the Arizona State Court of Appeals. And then she was um, on the Court of Appeals uh, when she was nominated. So while today, and we can, we'll can, we talk about, um, I'll probably let our special guest talk about uh, Judge uh, uh, Brown Jackson's stellar record. Back then, women weren't offered those paths that are often the traditional path to the Supreme Court. But fortunately, Ronald Reagan, for political reasons largely, um, made the commitment that he would find a qualified woman. And she actually, and, and Sandra Day O'Connor had been active in Republican circles, was known to Republicans, and got appointed. Uh, then it, it took 12 more years to get a, another woman, which was uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, that you probably, you know, was, you know, hope you've seen the movies, recommend them highly. There's several of them, documentaries, movies, and you can see Ruth Bader Ginsburg also had a sort of a non-traditional path because she had the same challenges that Sandra Day O'Connor had had. And then again, it was um, a while again before uh, we got um, Justice Sotomayor, who was the first Latina American um, uh, woman nominated uh, by uh, uh, Barack, President Obama. And then Elena Kagan, uh, Justice Kagan came on shortly thereafter. And then in 2020, uh, Amy Coney Barrett was nominated, and now we have um, Justice uh, Kadanji Brown Jackson. But it is always, you know, along the way, it's always been political. When when uh, when Ruth Bader Ginsburg um, passed away, and uh, President Trump had the opportunity to nominate him, it had been very clear from his, you know, his two previous nominations were men replacing men. Um, if, if he were to have that opportunity to replace Ruth Bader Ginsburg for any reason, Amy Coney Barrett has sort of been the nominee that folks had thought. And because that's the way Trump thought sort of, oh, we have a woman to replace a woman. <laughs> um, that was, you know, he said right from the start, he was going to uh, nominate a woman for that spot. So the idea that, you know, nominating a woman is something strange is only become, you know, I, I don't, I, I'm a Republican, as you all know, but that's been a, a bit of a, a bizarre turn of events <laughs> that uh, people have complained about that. But because we have a great guest here today, who kind of, we're in the same age bracket, uh, we have followed these Supreme Court, Court nominations, both men and women, um, throughout our careers in, in different ways that we can talk about. So I wanted to introduce our special guest today, um, Ruth Marcus, who also was an um, American University Science Institute fellow, I believe it was last year. And she began writing uh, for the Washington Post while still in Law, law school. She also went to Harvard Law School and uh, formally joined the paper after graduation. She has been with the Washington Post since 1984, joined the national staff in 1986, covering campaign finance, the Justice Department, the Supreme Court, and the White House. From 1999 through 2002, she served as deputy national editor, supervising reporters who covered money and politics, Congress, the Supreme Court, and other national issues. And she joined the editorial board in 2003 and began writing a regular column in 2006. She is also the author on a, a Supreme Court book called Supreme Ambition, Brett Kavanaugh and the Conservative Takeover, uh, which was published in 2019. And so I am delighted to 
um, have uh, my friend and special guest here, Ruth Marcus, join us today. Great to see you today, Ruth. Hi, Barbara. Um, thank you for having me. And thanks again to the Science Institute for all it's done. And this is a, a great topic. So I'm really happy to talk about it. Barbara, I think you might be muted. Let me see. There you go. Oh, okay, there we go. Okay. Now I've got my video off. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, Judge Katanji Brown, who actually has had very much of a traditional background, I'll let you uh, talk about her and her really stellar background, which actually is um, as uh, you know more background, you know, in that traditional fight than many of the even current nominees have had. So she comes to uh, the court and to this nomination with um, you know just top background across the board and on all fronts. So why don't I kick it over to you to just give us her background and what you see as sort of how this uh, whole nomination is going to go forward. Sure. Um, well, it's, it's going to be interesting to compare and contrast her background and Justice O'Connor's background, because it really does explain the trajectory of how women have progressed through the legal profession or more explicitly how the legal profession has accommodated itself and society has accommodated itself to the reality of women lawyers and women judges. Um, Judge Jackson's background is uh, both traditional and not traditional. Um, it's traditional in the sense that she had opportunities available to her that a Justice um, O'Connor and Justice Ginsburg didn't really have available to them. When she graduated from law school, she was able to get clerkships, including with Justice Breyer, who she's slated to replace. Those were all but impossible to get for women of Justice Ginsburg and Justice O'Connor's age. She was able to go to uh, several significant large law firms which were eager to have women which was not true of justice ginsburg and justice o'connor who needed to find alternate routes um, her background then actually became slightly untraditional in the sense that um, she spent some time on the u.s sentencing commission as an attorney then left to do something that no uh, justice has done which is to work as a federal public defender and i think this is going to be both an aspect of her confirmation hearings, which I'll get back to in a second, but also assuming that she's confirmed, which I think is all but certain, um, will definitely bring an important dimension um, to the Supreme Court because look, of course it matters if there are women on the Supreme Court, but it also matters what background these women have. A Justice Amy Coney Barrett is very different from a Justice Elena Kagan or a Justice Sonia Sotomayor. Um, so Justice Jackson uh, bringing that public defender and sentencing expertise to the court is a really important thing. Uh, then she became, um, after some time on the Sentencing Commission, um, a district court judge. And this is another um, really important um, piece of her background because we do not have uh, a lot of experience among the sitting justices of somebody who has handled trials. I think that Justice, Justice Sotomayor was a district court judge for a while, unless I'm completely misremembering things. Um, but, but most judges come from an appellate background. Justice Kagan was nominated to the DC Circuit, but never confirmed. So she hadn't served as a judge at all. It is really different when you know what it's like to be in the hot seat of a trial court judge making evidentiary rulings, what it's like to sentence people. That is also important. So she comes to the court with a pretty remarkable background, I think. And this is not um, an ideological comparison, but it's just a fact comparison. Uh, because there has been some sniping about her relatively short time on the DC circuit. That's true, she's been on the DC circuit for less than a year, I think. But she also has seven or eight years as a trial court judge before that. That is more judicial experience than many of her male and female counterparts and future colleagues, um, including Justice Barrett, who had, I think it was three years on the Seventh Circuit before she became a judge. So I think it's going to be, I, I think we know the, how this book ends. She will be confirmed. I think the interesting thing um, will be that very little, if any of this, will be about her being a woman, about her being a mom, 
one little digression is it's really interesting. Justice O'Connor and Justice Ginsburg both came to the court at, as married women, as married women with children, but their careers really, and their judicial careers certainly took off after that. Then we had Justice Sotomayor who was divorced, Justice Kagan who was not married, who came to the court um, without children. And now we have like this new generation of female justices who, Justice Barrett, who famously has seven children, Justice Jackson's children are a little bit older than Justice Barrett's, but um, she has two. Um, and, and this, I think, really illustrates the development of women in the legal profession, which is, you can have it all, you can have it all. These women know, as you do, Barbara, that you can't have it all, but you can have it in chapters and you can try to do your best with it. Um, and I think finally, it's really fascinating to have gone in our lifetimes from having no women on the Supreme Court to one, which is a curiosity, to you know, eventually over many years, three, which is a significant number, four is a plurality. That's one short of a majority. It's a different world and this is a better world. And the world is enough to grant cert. Yes, and the world, not that they would all, not that they all vote the same or that they should vote right. the same. If I could, I would actually prefer to have two and two if I were dividing them up. Um, <laughs> but uh, just the last sentence I'll say about this is if you look at President Biden's ability to choose, even from the limited pool that he said, which was a black woman, and President Reagan's ability to choose from the pool that he identified, which was a woman, there are so many, and this does not take anything away from Justice O'Connor, who was a terrific justice, but there are so many more women in the legal profession today, so many more women qualified and credentialed in the legal profession today, that as much as we might wonder about where, when equity finally comes, this trajectory from O'Connor to Jackson really shows us from zero to four, really how far we've come. Yes. No, and, and I, I, do you think the, um, I know there's been some talk, I, I think it's an asset that she, and actually I signed a letter with other Republican former Justice Department officials um, in support of, uh, of Judge uh, Brown Jackson, as, as did uh, Judge Michael Ludig, who was sort of the runner up for the Supreme Court when, when John Roberts was picked, as well as uh, Judge uh, Tom Griffith and another notable a Republican uh, judges who've known her and know, know her work, who've, who've called upon Republicans to look at her record and understand. And I signed on to the letter saying, listen, I know I'm not going to agree with her on opinions the way that I probably will agree with um, Amy Coney Barrett or John Roberts and Sam Alito, whose confirmations I worked on. You know, those are more in, in where I might end up on a, from a legal standpoint, although I think what you always see is justices, no matter whoever appoints them, always surprise people and, and, and don't always do what you think they're going to do. And that included Ruth Bader Ginsburg, too. And it also, you know, in the past, in 2020, included all of the Trump nominees saying no to his Supreme Court appeals. Yay for them. But um, do you think there'll be any criticism of her working in the Sentencing Commission or having that defense background? To, to me, it seems like an asset. I know when I worked at the Justice Department, the people in the senior roles, I always found, say, when Mike Chertoff uh, worked with the criminal division chief, I thought it was important that he had been a judge, that he had been a you know in the defense world, and that he understood the whole 360 of the judicial system. Uh, don't I mean, to me, it would be stupid to attack that because I think that's an asset to have on the court. But do you sense that that will be a line of attack? Absolutely. Prepare for stupidity <laughs> um, and prepare. And it's actually not really stupidity. It's deliberate obtuseness. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to name names here for where I think it um, is likely to come from, and I, but maybe not limited to that. You have a number of people, as you know, on the Senate Judiciary Committee who have presidential dreams of presidential campaigns dancing in their heads. And for them, um, we saw a little bit of a preview of this with a district court nominee who just got out of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Nina Morrison. This is a nominee who has spent her 
entire career trying to make sure that innocent people, innocent people are freed from prison and going after the convictions of innocent people. They attacked her for teaming up with so-called progressive prosecutors and said, why are you working with these people who want to put armed and dangerous criminals back on the street? And there was just a lot of posturing there from people who honestly know better. And the posturing came from Ted Cruz. It came from Josh Hawley. It came a little bit from Mike Lee. It came from Tom Cotton. And they, I believe, um, all or some of them, and maybe even more, are going to go after Judge Jackson for um, having represented uh, criminal defendants in general and putting dangerous, trying to put dangerous people back on the street. Pause for anybody who doesn't understand this. It is um, a constitutional necessity for um, people to have counsel. It is a constitutional necessity for indigent people to be provided counsel. It, our system cannot work fairly or constitutionally if people who are accused of crimes don't have lawyers. Those lawyers are doing a public service um, prosecutors would tell you they're doing a public service. Um, and their job is to represent their clients um, as zealously as they possibly can. So Judge Jackson is going to be attacked for that. She's going to be particularly attacked for, and I was just seeing some tweets about this before we started. She's going to be particularly attacked for representing Guantanamo detainees, i.e. accused terrorists. And well, why did you do that? Why did you do that when you were a public defender? Why did you continue to represent them voluntarily on a pro bono basis after you left the public defender service and you were a lawyer in private practice? Answer, this is what lawyers do. Lawyers um, take on the cases of, and you know, lawyers from John Adams back in the day representing um, British soldiers um, understand that our legal system requires zealous advocacy on both sides. You're not representing the Guantanamo terrorist because he's a terrorist. You're representing him because you believe in the fair um, application of the rule of law and that there are serious arguments. You and I might disagree about them, but we recognize that there are serious arguments about um, due process and right to um, hearings for these um, Guantanamo detainees that is not going to stop people from kind of waving the bloody shirt of terrorism. It's not gonna have an impact, except it may have an impact probably to the better, I would wish to the worse on their presidential hopes. Yeah, you know, it, yeah, that was painful. I saw the questioning by Ted Cruz up because I have a Republican daughter who's conservative, votes conservative, and she works, um, does DNA analysis. She works for a company that does DNA analysis. So she often works with prosecutors to put away a lot of rapists. It's often rapists in cases she's testifying in, but she also works with the Innocence Project when they have somebody who may have been wrongly accused so that there's DNA and they can also exonerate somebody. So the idea that you have to work on one side or the other, that's why I've always thought it's very important for senior Justice Department officials to have had both sides. I know, and I, when I, when I ran for office, I got attacked for working on Scooter Libby's legal case, who somebody who had a, and I remember I was at a law firm at the time, and we had people at our law firm who were representing uh, people like uh, Gitmo also. And I was getting attacked within my law firm for representing Scooter. And God bless my managing partner who said, listen, we've got people representing <laughs> Gitmo detainees. We got, we got someone and we're going to support them both. And that's what good law firms do. And you have you know a cross section of that. And you always want to have that. Uh, in the legal system, that's an important thing for those of you who want to uh, ever practice law that you're going to have people who can look at both sides. Because if you only have prosecutors, it's all gas and no break. If you're only doing the defense, you you know you never understand that might you know the other side. So I always think it's good to you know. And in, in law school, oftentimes they you know if you're in one of those programs in law school, in, in sort of a criminal justice program, they always make you go in and do both the defense and the prosecution and even if you never do anything else but that, it gives you a great perspective and, you know, wanting to make this right. And as a, on the government side, you're to do justice. You're not to just win, you're to do justice. And if justice is exonerated, somebody innocent, that's what you do too. So we do have some questions here. So I want to get them um, here. Uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's a little bit what we've talked about on 
Uh, Tyler is asking, what are your takes on uh, three GOP senators, Graham, Collins, and Murkowski, who voted for Judge Jackson, um, now looking like they may not? I actually think they're probably going to, at least two of them, probably be more likely to than not. But, uh, you know, I, I do think you're going to see two or three or more, you know, if, if as I mean, Paul Ryan has also endorsed her, so wouldn't be surprised to see Mitt Romney support her. It's, it's, a, it's a they're sort of a distant family relation, but Paul has said she's got great integrity, brilliant, and you know all the things you would want in a judge. So um, where you know don't don't you think she will end up with some Republican support? I, I think that she's likely to end up with the support of Senator Collins. I think it's probable that she'll end up with the support of Senator Murkowski. Senator Graham seems to be in a bit of a snit because um, as he is wont to do, um, because his preferred candidate, Michelle Childs, who's a nominee for the federal appeals court here in DC um, was not chosen. It's really hard to see how he could justify voting for Judge Jackson less than a year ago to the DC circuit and then refused to vote to confirm her to the Supreme Court, but I'm sure he'll find some distinction. I am still crossing my fingers that he will um, change his mind. And Senator Romney would be interesting, though he did vote against her. I have a little bit of hope, little bit of hope for some of the retiring senators who um, know that this is, unless you're going to, and when you and I were younger, Barbara, which was a, a long time ago, <laughs> at least for me, um, we, Senator, um, Justice, Justice Scalia was um, confirmed by a vote of 92 to eight. Justice Breyer, I believe, was confirmed by 87 votes. Those days are long gone, but the days of absolute, you know, 100% partisan Supreme Court votes, I guess are here with us um, and they are gonna be here with us for the bet for years to come, but that's really unfortunate. and. Senators should understand that elections have consequences for both Democratic presidents and Republican presidents, and that Judge Jackson is well within the realm of acceptable nominee of a Democratic president. And so unless you're reflexively voting against every Democratic Supreme Court nominee, you should be voting for her. I, so I retain some hope for senators like Rob Portman, Roy of Ohio, Roy Blunt of Missouri, who are retiring and know what the right thing to do is. Yeah, and that's something politically, the historic firsts usually have gotten, you know, large numbers. Um, as, as you mentioned, um, Justice O'Connor, I think was unanimous in one abstention. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was 96 to three. Um, now you had uh, Justice Sotomayor was 68 to 31. Justice Kagan, 63 to 37. Um, now, Amy Coney Barrett was 52 to 48. There were probably some other factors there because of the election year. But we have a question about, you know, how politicized it has become. And of course, we, you know, Ruth and I, we lived through sort of the original, you know, the Bork hearings, which were sort of the original political politicized hearing um, where um, Justice, I mean, uh, Senator Kennedy famously uh, went after Judge Bork is, you know, that he was going to, um, you know, ruin life as we know it, really went after it. I think a lot of these sort of original sort of animosity that's made it political really came out of that because he certainly, I, I can speak from the Republican side that, and just uh, Judge Bork was both a friend and a constituent of mine. And um, I uh, got to know him uh, well over the years. And of course he was very instrumental in the Federalist Society and a lot of, uh, judges who followed that Republicans have nominated. But um, I think that sort of resentment and then what followed with uh, Clarence Thomas, which of course had other issues related to it, but but really kind of got this whole politicized nature of the of court in motion. But I did want to, I wanted to read something because I thought it was very interesting um, how oftentimes while you hear all these political things about these justices and the attacks, um, both sides have tended to be wrong on where somebody's going to come down on an issue. And this is an example of that. This was um, somebody uh, who Senator Kennedy didn't like a Republican nominee and this is what he had to say about him. And he said, the nominee's record 
raised troubling, quote, raised troubling questions about the depth of his commitment to the role of the Supreme Court and Congress in protecting individual rights and liberties under the Constitution. His record on civil rights was particularly troubling, troubling among other things, when litigating on behalf of a state, the nominee had made reactionary arguments contesting the extent of Congress's power to protect against discrimination. And the nominee, quote, was willing to defend the indefensible um, and had demonstrated a willingness to discriminate against the poor and uneducated. And he, his record on sex discrimination raised troubling questions. And he was not genuinely concerned about the rights of women. And of course, he found the nominees' responses on Roe versus Wade, quote, alarming. Now, those quotes were all Senator Ted Kennedy um, talking about David Souter. So David Souter, who ended up, be, he was a Republican nominee by George Herbert Walker Bush, um, and was one of the ones that probably Republicans were least happy about, but he ended up being a very reliable vote on all those very things that just that Senator Kennedy had attacked him on. Uh, similarly, you could find those same kind of quotes about uh, Justice Anthony Kennedy, who even he was the substitute after Bork and another interim nominee had been um, uh, proposed by Ronald Reagan, but many of the women's groups opposed Justice Kennedy who ended up being, of course, a, a vote for Roe versus Wade. He also was the uh, writer of the gay marriage decision. Um, and then um, also uh, Justice Robert, Chief Justice Roberts, who ended up being the vote to uphold, sort of the deciding vote to uphold o Obamacare. I worked on his um, nomination. I can tell you all those kind of things that were said about David Souter and Justice Kennedy were also said about Justice Roberts. And while you know, I worked on Roberts and Alito, they, they often have differing opinions on things. I think they're both great justices as my neighbor, um, whose house I can see from my window, <laughs> Justice Kennedy, who I think also is a spectacular justice. So this whole politicization has gotten so out of control, which is why I think you see a Judge Ludig and others say, let's stop politicizing it. Democrats are gonna nominate different people than Republicans will, but these justices have lifetime appointments and they, Usually, and I think the Trump cases show that best, they, they vote based on the law in those cases. And I, I hope people will start having a little bit more trust in that as they've seen that. So, so, um, those guys all got attacked in their nominations. Oh, these Trump judges, they're going to be Trump judges. Trump called them Trump judges. They are not Trump judges, justices. God bless them. <laughs> Um, so Barbara, I'm going to um, respectfully disagree with you on two fronts. Um, the, the, the first is actually about Judge Bork, and you um, referenced the career of Justice Kennedy, who was the third choice um, after the Bork nomination. There was another Ginsburg nominated, Doug Ginsburg, and that um, went up in flames, as it were, over um, allegations of smoking pot with students. And um, then we got Justice Kennedy. There was... I. I covered the Bork hearings. From my point of view, it, it did usher in, you're completely right, a new age in which, first of all, the issue of a justices, a potential justices ideology became fair game. And second of all, it was a much more um, politicized process and the bad feelings about quote unquote Borking persist to this day. I would argue that uh, Judge Bork's um, it, that the Supreme Court was a better place from my point of view, which is different from your point of view, without a Justice Bork on there for precisely the reasons that you mentioned with Justice Kennedy. Um, if Judge Bork had been on the Supreme Court, um, we would not have um, seen uh, Roe versus Wade reaffirmed eventually um, in the Planned Parenthood v. Casey case, which surprised us all. We would not have seen gay marriage become the law of the land. There were many, many cases in which the fight against Judge Bork, which produced a Justice Kennedy, made a very big difference for our country, a difference from my point of view to the better. So that's disagreement number one. Um, disagreement number two um, is uh, about whether you can predict where justices are. Your quotes about Justice Souter, and I knew that punchline was coming, <laughs> um, are totally spot on. I have um, really embarrassing clips that I wrote after even Justice Souter's first term on the court about um, how if he hadn't wasn't a home run for conservatives as um, uh, 
President Bush's chief of staff, John Sununu, promised he was at least like it was some baseball analogy, but a really good double. Um, and he turned out to be something quite different. I think those days have passed. Justices have moments when they surprise us, as with Chief Justice voting to uphold Obamacare. But much more now than ever before, justices are selected for and have sorted themselves out for and are carefully, carefully, carefully vetted by both sides for um, where their ideology is. That is why um, especially the Federalist Society and the Republican presidents who have increasingly relied on the Federalist Society have, have made it their um, promise to have no more suitors. And no more suitors means no more surprises. And what that means is somebody who has enough of a judicial paper trail that you can be confident as the nominating president as, and as the, the troops supporting the nomination about where that judge will come out. So I think much more than previously, we are not getting justices who surprise us. So um, no, no more suitors is uh, both a vow and, and these days a prediction. But you did have people like you know, Justice uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg when you had different things. I remember during the Obama years where some of the Obama cases they brought it, you know, were shot down 9 0. So you had, you know, a, a Breyer, a Ruth Bader Ginsburg saying no to President Obama. So this notion that I think President Trump really brought to uh, I, I, that this was a totally political body. Um, that still, hopefully, is not. Yes, you do have different, you know, approaches to the law. Let, let and from a conservative standpoint, they want you know more of these things to be decided, um, you know, by the legislatures. And, and as, as Justice Roberts famously said, you know, we call balls and strikes in, in the court. We don't do that. But you still, there still is this notion that I think has gotten out of hand that this is a very political body. And I think you saw, you see people like Justice Breyer, as well as Justice Roberts, push back on that notion philosophically, that they aren't there to be political. And that lifetime appointment does enable them to have a different, you know, not get too caught up in the politics of things. Um, so I, I do remember when Bush v. Gore was decided, yes, it was 5-4, so it was very, <laughs> but I remember, um, you know, that is not your best argument, Barbara, yeah. for, for a non-political decision. Yeah. That is yeah. actually but, your worst argument for a non-political decision. Yeah. Well, yeah, that you did have the Republicans decide about, but um, you still the, the the I don't certainly a lot of people were saying that these the judges, the Trump nominated justices, were going to oh, if they're on there, they're gonna, you know. The notion was that they would take up all these cases that Trump thought, you know, that he was going to because he put these people on the court and there are, you know, 60 cases later um, on his uh, election challenges. He's been shot down and every one many times by Federalist Society judges at the appellate level as, as well as the Supreme Court. So maybe. Yeah, I mean, I think philosophically you have those issues, but I think when it comes to just sort of the the notion that these are just political votes as opposed to approaches to the law that are different. I, I think maybe, maybe that's where well, we I, th I think I see it as, as more of a gradation, honestly. For the most part, is a, it is a conservative jurisprudence versus a more liberal progressive jurisprudence yeah. and honestly a different vision of cons both constitutional and statutory interpretation that explains most of the differences. Um, I, I think that um, there are not Trump judges in the sense that these many, many of the conservative justices, I think, roll their eyes privately about Donald Trump and his excesses and certainly his legal excesses in the frivolous cases that he and his lawyers brought to the court and somehow expected loyalty in return from the people <laughs> that he had nominated and stuck Maybe by. You understand the lifetime <laughs> um, but, I, but I do also think that there is, um, that the overlap right now between um, the conservative philosophy and the partisanship um, it do doesn't go to, I will do everything that Donald Trump commands me to do, but the two sides have sorted themselves out pretty well. Mm -hmm. And to me, the um, best evidence of that was in Bush versus Gore, where the conservatives <laughs> took, uh, and this was quite a long time ago in a much less conservative court, 
but they took if they didn't behave in a partisan way um i don't know how you would explain how they behaved this is a case in which they said this is this decision is kind of only good for this one time only um so don't come back to us with any more of these claims and well that was, that was a tough one to swallow okay. well de debating because the great ted Olson, who then also was the person who uh argued the uh, gay marriage case won both of those cases so um again uh expectations are always a little different on that but that's a whole nother class that will probably i, I haven't uh bowed up on my bush v gore recently but uh we do have a question that sort of i think gets it into the political realm too somebody asks here do you think there should be term limits on the supreme court yes yes really? i do um i think term limits you know there's a debate about whether that would more likely than not require a constitutional amendment and how we could get that but I think putting term limits on the court would really turn down the temperature of each individual nomination. You would know as it, as term limits took effect that every president would get his or her allotment of nominees, that it wouldn't be the accident that say a President Carter got zero nominees and a President Trump got three. That would mean that the court, um, it wouldn't just turn down the temperature of individual nominations, but it would mean that the court would in the best possible way follow the election returns. If we had a country that elected more Republican presidents than Democratic presidents, you would have more a more conservative Supreme Court that mirrored the country as well. If you had more Democratic presidents elected and you know we can get into a side conversation about the presidential election system and the electoral <laughs> college and the popular vote and everything else, but it would be fairer and more reflective of the country than we have now. I would love to see that. Conversely, I would really worry very deeply about the notion of expanding the court. Um, it is mm -hmm. tempting, but I think it would be like destroying the village in order to save it. I am not willing to go anywhere near that far, but I would work very hard as a columnist to get us to get to term imposing term limits if we could ever do that. Well, I, I agree with you on the ex, uh, court expansion because that, uh, I think that would politicize it more and and then you know keep but I, I guess what kind of term limits would you look at in terms of how long? Or? I, people have talked about 18 years um, and I think that number kind of works well with presidential terms and things like that, you phase it in. But it really, um, it kind of doesn't matter because the logistics of getting us there are so difficult. And, and honestly, um, from my point of view, we have a Supreme Court that is dangerously askew, that is way too far tilted to the right, that is proving itself willing to do really radical things. And I think we're gonna see more radical things before this current term is done. Um, and moving into next term as well. Um, and so term limits would not even by themselves solve that immediate problem. Because I guess, yeah, because well, we have uh, Justice uh, Thomas has been on the court for over 30, I guess it's a little over 30 years now. And, and then um, Amy Coney Barrett, less, less than two. So that's the range we have right now. But with, with Breyer and Ginsburg there till recently, they had all, Serve long. Why well, I, I I have never supported term limits in Congress because I always thought you know the voters are the term limits. So that's an interesting debate on the uh, judicial side that we you know usually. Well, there's two other things. Have to say about term limits. Um, one is that uh, I do not think that the framers imagined uh, a lifespan as long as the lifespans that we're all hopefully privileged to live now. Um, so that when they provided for life tenure, it was a very different thing. The other thing yeah. is that I think that one thing that would be really good about having term limits is that it would incentivize president, it would remove the incentive for presidents to name people who are ridiculously young. I am, I have to say, a lot more judicious, if not smarter now at 63 <laughs> than I was at 43. Um, I'm not sure they're going to be picking 63 year olds, but it would give you less of an incentive to pick people in their early 40s. You could pick people 50, 55, maybe even go crazy and pick 60 year olds because you know the likelihood would be that they would remain on the bench for their full term. 
Yeah, that is a good that 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 is a good point because oftentimes you age out on the Supreme Court. You know, it's like so you have this path that you've got to be like in place by you know for a circuit court judgeship by your late thirties, forties, and then then be you know in your late forties, early fifties, and and once you get past that, you've aged out for a court, which is really sad because given the longevity and and certainly the wisdom to the idea that you couldn't have. Youthful sixty-year-olds yeah, yeah. <laughs> go, go be uh, you know, and particularly you know, perhaps for women that is a you know, because oftentimes they're you know if they have children or they're out of the workforce or things they aren't getting there. But one of the things uh, I, I thought because we're seeing you know we're seeing more diversity on the court, but maybe as some have pointed out, not diversity of of say like where they went to law school or um, some of their backgrounds and things. What what are the prospects do you see going forward? Because I start that we'll have more because we're seeing more diversity in Congress of backgrounds and the kind of people who, who in, in terms of women who advance. Uh, do you see that you know from the nominations that we had? You know the three women who were sort of made it to the finals. Was it, um, you know that they had more diverse backgrounds too. And do you see going forward that we'll have those type of opportunities to get women with you know different backgrounds, maybe, you know, go back to having maybe women who have academic backgrounds. I mean, Earl Warren was a, was a, what, he was a, a governor, okay. right? He, he got on the court. So can women ever be, have those sort of alternative backgrounds the way men have, you know, in the past were allowed well, to Well, we really haven't had men with alternative backgrounds in- Well, some of them weren't judges, weren't, weren't okay. lawyers back in the early days, right? Yeah, I'm, know, not, I'm not sure I would law. go for, I'm not <laughs> sure I would go for that, but I do think, look, President Clinton was interested in this, um, wanted to think about getting somebody with legislative and political experience on the court. He talked to um, Governor Cuomo, he talked to mm -hmm. Bruce Babbitt, his interior secretary. He really um, mm -hmm. uh, toyed with a lot of potential diverse in that sense of background nominees. I think having people who understand the legislative process, um, uh, understand what it's like to make those kinds of political choices would be a good thing on the court. I think it was good to have um, Governor Warren on the court. I think it was good to have um, Sandra Day O'Connor, who had been a minority leader, I think, of the Arizona Senate. Maybe she was majority leader. She was majority. Um, yeah. yeah. So I didn't mean to put you in the minority. <laughs> um, and um, I, I think that those are, um, th th that's a skill set that you don't develop at having taught at a law school and being on an appeals court necessarily. So I would like to see more of that. Um, it would be um, perhaps having gone to Harvard and Yale, I have to admit, maybe a little, um, I don't know, less than convincing for me to talk about um, academic diversity. I think it- well, Maybe we could have someone, because that's one of the nominees, I mean, one of the finalists was someone who had gone to a, like state college, state schools, because the range of colleges and law schools of the current nine is pretty limited, right? It's very limited. Justice um, uh, Barrett went to Notre Dame, and that's Notre Dame, which I keep mispronouncing in the French way. Um, and that's pretty much it in terms of diversity on this court. Yeah, yeah. So that's so So for all of you out there looking to go, to, it is safe. I, I think in the future, and I do think this is going to be the case for women in leadership and all kinds of roles, you know, traditionally, Initially, women had to sort of like catching up to where men traditionally went through. And now I think because of, um, you know, we're all, you know, we can all learn online and constantly be updating our skills. And there's just so many different places to be advancing and ways to advance that you don't have to have that traditional background, whether you're in Congress or a governor or you know, heading up a company because you, you don't have to finish college. You know, Bill Gates did pretty well, not <laughs> dropping out of Harvard, right? You, yeah, you got some Harvard dropouts who've done pretty well. If you want to be on the Supreme Court, don't drop out of college. And yes, if you get into true. Harvard or Yale, you might as well go there. Um, <laughs> yes, and you, you don't have if you to, want yeah, to be we, a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, go ahead, drop out. Yeah, yeah. no, and, and, and we don't want to lower the standards either, but I think the idea that you can get a great education and a in a state school or a state law school, I, I know over the years, as I hired people, when I worked at the Justice Department, when I was chief counsel on the Hill, 
um, when I was in office myself, I found great lawyers uh, from a lot of, uh, you know, from actually one of my hires is uh, now the Lieutenant Governor, soon to be Arkansas Attorney General. Um, and he had gone to a small school in Arkansas and I think uh, he went to Tulane Law School, but um, yeah, I, I think there's a lot, you know, don't, because I, I know one of the things that I see, um, and I know we all lived through that going to school. I didn't get into Harvard till I went to Harvard Institute of Politics. So I had to lose That's Congress to, to get into Congress, to get into Harvard. But so many parents and, and students freak out over being in, you know, in the right school. If you don't do this, you're not going to be on that path. And I guess do finish college. If you want to, you know, be a Supreme Court justice, do go to law school. And I, having worked on those, I did realize the people that I worked up with on their confirmations, just Justice Roberts and Justice Alito, were in a realm of law that I never could have, you know, done what they do. I mean, Ted Olson, who was a solicitor general, the way he, you know, argues cases and learns them and and really, you know, knows that um, how to present that, that's a totally different level. So um, I, I think you do want to have people who uh, are smart like that. Ted actually didn't go to Harvard. He went to Berkeley. So, uh, and he majored in uh, debate actually. So uh, you you don't have to just go to Harvard or Yale to get on these paths to, to be a judge, to be a justice. And I, I maybe, I hope that because I, I hate to see kids freak out that if they don't get in the right college or the right law school, that their life is over. And I think I think that is changing, that there'll be more open because there are so many more kids who go to college and law school these days. There's, you can be 4.0 everything and I've seen, and you still can't get into those schools. And oftentimes your parents or grandparents don't understand how much more competitive it is for you these days. But I think that also means that it's, you know, there are great, there's great talent and a much wider diversity of schools than say in our age, what people went to look for. Does that make sense? That or, makes total sense. Okay. Let me see, we have a few more questions here from the audience that I'll say. Um, okay, since a SCOTUS nomination is so huge, do you think that the nominees should be confirmed by not just the Senate, but also the House? Get confirmed. Well, as a House member, I say no, a former House member. <laughs> I think, you know, I think the founders got it right. It would be even more politicized in that case. I can't, I mean, I was in Congress when there was a Supreme Court, you know, two, actually two that were up and people would call. I remember I, we'd get calls and they'd say, we don't want Barbara to vote for her. So I said, well, don't worry, she's not voting for you. I'd tell her she, she can't vote. And they'd say, I remember we once had a, somebody call and say, I'm a history teacher and I want to tell you this, I don't want you to vote for it. I said, well, I can't vote for it. And you're a history teacher and you should know that. And they got very upset with me, but um, <laughs> uh, so maybe our education system needs some more help too. But no, I'd, I'd say no on the house voting myself. How about you, Ruth? <laughs> um, well, it would take Supreme Court confirmations from zoo to I don't know what's worse <laughs> than zoo, but I am completely in agreement with you. And it would take a constitutional amendment. Um, now, Biden, uh, uh, President Biden did initially have that commission on potentially expanding the court. That does seem to, that we have a question about that. That does seem to have gone by the wayside now, um, as we discussed a little, but uh, on the term limits thing, we have another question. Do you think that's something that President Biden might be open to? And obviously, since you'd have to change the law on that, given how divided we are, probably the prospect, you know, if Democrats were in charge, Republicans wouldn't want to do it. If Republicans are in charge, you know, then Democrats wouldn't want to do that. So how would you ever get to something on a term limit basis? Yeah. Given that whoever, I mean, in Virginia, we still have a term limited governor because everyone thinks, well, you, you know, they don't want to change it because it might help the other side. <laughs> so how would, in the so reverse. I, I think that President Biden's Supreme Court Commission did what President Biden's Supreme Court Commission was supposed to do, which was to drain some of the heat out of the process. And um, as the left of his party was demanding that he go all in for court expansion, um, the best way to diffuse that is to name a commission to study it and take it seriously. And so they did. And so um, some of the energy has been drained off there. Um, and it was a bipartisan commission. It had some pretty 
it was, it was, it did a, you know, it did a serious job and a serious study, but, um, and it's very interesting to read their work product, but it wasn't designed to achieve any change other than to settle down the left. I'm sorry to be so, so cynical about it. Uh, I think President Biden, you know, <clears throat> has a huge amount on his plate, um, instituting term limits that would, um, make the system better in the future might not be at the top of his to-do list and it would be hard to do um, uh, for all the reasons that you identified. Be an interesting kind of game theory question. If you instituted this and you made it start at some time in the future, there might be some kind of veil of ignorance where both neither side would know whether that would end up um, hurting uh, their side or hurting the other side. And so who would be advantaged by that. You, you could imagine it, but it still is a very, I think, um, unlikely outcome. Well, and we do have another question um, about that is asking, uh, kind of getting back to the confirmation process. And since you wrote a whole book about, you know, one confirmation, um, you know, how much of the confirmation process is just rhetoric? And I think often, you know, like, of course, abortion is always such a big issue that comes up. And whether it's a Democrat nominee or Republican, they usually say, you know, we're going to decide based on the law. They don't, you know, tend to want to indicate how they are going to rule on a case because you really don't want them to say that. And yet, whether if it's a Republican nominee, they kind of badger the Democrat to say how they rule and vice versa. So how do we, you know, I mean, don't we want in the confirmation process people to tell us they are going to be open-minded and they, but maybe give us a little bit about their philosophy and not tell us how they're going to decide particular cases? Well, you know, Judge Bork talked a lot. This is this is where you're going to say, aha, now you're undercutting your argument. Judge Bork <laughs> was the last nominee to be willing to, and he needed to in order to get confirmed because of some of his writings to describe his philosophy, judicial philosophy and legal philosophy in a very full and not um, constrained, I couldn't talk about that, that could conceivably come before me kind of way. He was pretty open and um, we all saw what happened to him. He was not confirmed, um, um, not confirmed because of the votes of a number of Republican senators as well as Democrats. But um, I, there's a big debate among people who write about these things about whether Supreme Court hearings, confirmation hearings have become so much of us, I think Justice Kagan, um, before she was Justice Kagan, when she was um, simply a law professor observing these things, um, described it as a charade, um, whether they become so much of a charade that they're not worth having, or whether they are still valuable um, enterprises for the Senate and the country um, to go through. I am a believer in the second part. I think that there, there's all sorts of reasons, both um, legitimate because you don't want to say that you have a fixed view about something and also tactical. You don't want to say, I know I'm going to overturn Roe v. Wade the minute I get to that point, um, the minute that the choice comes before me. Um, you don't want to answer that question because you know you're just going to have, first of all, actually, it would be wrong, um, but also um, it would torpedo you with certain people. Um, is it, it'll be really interesting if this, the one good thing from my point of view, um, if the Supreme Court it does this summer overturn row will be that it will drain that issue uh, to some extent out of confirmation hearings. But um, I think confirmation hearings are our last best chance to get a glimpse of a justice who is gonna retreat behind robes and all the insulation that the Supreme Court provides to get a way of understanding how much, you know, what his or her grasp of the law is, what his or her judicial philosophy is, um, how they go about, how they can talk about the cases that they've ruled on if they have um, judicial backgrounds. They can talk about um, what they bring to the table in terms of their previous life experiences. There are always, there's always some question that um, for better or worse, um, trips up a justice. Justice um, Judge Bork, never to be Justice Bork, um, was asked why he wanted to be on the court. And he famously said, because it would be an intellectual feast. Um, that's actually not what you want to, uh, that was 
real on his part, but that's not probably why you should want to be on the Supreme Court because you want to do justice, because you want to uphold the rule of law, because you want to give uh, meaning to the phrases of the Constitution and to get it right. Um, I, this was an unfair one that tripped up Justice Barrett. She was asked about what the components of the First Amendment are, and she got maybe four out of five. And I just thought that did not say anything except for it's really exhausting to go through a confirmation hearing. Some people were were eager to jump on her for that. But I do think that confirmation hearings may be of limited value, but they are better than the alternative, which is no value at all. Okay. Well, and I know we, we um, have to let you go for a meeting, but I wanted to thank you so much. And one of the things I, because I know since you're a student of the Supreme Court, I know one of the most famous relationships that I've always thought was wonderful and you know, we all strive. I know one of the things the students have all asked, is there really bipartisanship out there in collegiality? And I certainly, you know, as everyone knows, as, as a lot of people know, I was a top target and had a lot of attacks, but I, you know, have great friends who were on the other side and got to work with on things. And being a friend and neighbor of Justice Scalia, as well as Justice Kennedy, I always loved the stories about the relationship between Justice uh, Scalia and, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, that was real and was so beautiful. And um, I do some work with the Scalia School of Government here, but also the Scalia Law School is there now. And I remember when, when that was named the Scalia Law School, we had politicians in Virginia who came out attacking it. You can't name it after Scalia, that is horrendous. And of course, uh, Justice Ginsburg very much supported it. And Justice Kagan came and spoke at the announcement. So it really was beautiful about, even though these guys would go at each other on the court, they did make each other better. The stories about, you know, Justice Scalia and Ginsburg sharing their opinions with each other beforehand, you know, if one was a majority of the, and, and the other was, you know, usually in the minority on a big case, they would kind of go at each other, like, come on, you can do better than this, you know? tighten it up and write it better. And I think that's what you want in the law. And you want people with really, and that's why, you know, at my law firm, you could represent Scooter Libby and you could rep represent Git Gitmo detainees because you want people who cross that spectrum in the law. So I do I, I do believe in that, uh, that they really do kind of come to a better result. And I think sometimes you see over time, justices change their views, not change their views, but maybe surprise the political world because they are in there with these really smart people tackling these tough issues. And they have these great clerks who are, that's a whole another thing we didn't talk about, but uh, Supreme Court clerkships are something I never could have done either. It's a whole nother brainwave of doing that, but you get exposed to so many, you know, brilliant people who are tackling issues who think differently than you do. And you want to hear that and process that before you make that decision. So, Hopefully we will, I think we'll see some of that in action. I think if, if the, guy, the senators who are run for president, they're always the worst questioners and they always vote against the nominees because they want to run for president and say they voted against them and not have, Amy Klobuchar did that too. And you'll probably see Josh Hawley, no doubt, Ted Cruz uh, do that too. But um, I, I think you're going to see a very uh, brilliant jurist in these hearings, which should make, and, and I think for women, and to, to, you know, if you can see it, you can be it. You're going to see that in action in those hearings. So for all the women interested in, in all that, do watch those hearings that I guess are coming up two weeks from today, right? Yep. Great. Well, thanks for having me. I'm going to run to my meeting or else I'm going to get in some big trouble. with. Okay. Family. And it also, you can read uh, Ruth's book and there's been lots of books from the, by the Supreme Court um, that I can, we can send around and, and recommend for you all to read and and thanks for joining us today. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Ruth. Bye. Bye.